Okay, shall we uh, get started? Um, what I'd like to do first of all is to uh, very briefly go through uh, some of the main points of what we were talking about yesterday. It was a fairly heavy day, and uh, uh, what I want to do is to try and emphasize some of the main issues that we discussed. Okay, so um, we were talking uh, initially about transition state theory, and uh, we talked about uh, the potential energy surface on which a reaction occurs. And this is a very simple potential energy surface for a very symmetric uh, a triatomic system, an atom reacting with a molecule. For more complex systems, we'll have much more complex potential energy surfaces. Um, and uh, which are much more difficult to represent fully. Uh, and what you usually do there is to show what are called the turning points, the stable species and the, uh, 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 the transition states, uh, the one or more transition states that you've got. Um, and uh, so this is the expression that we're interested in. Uh, we need, this is the difference in energy between uh, the zero-point energy of the reactants and of the transition state. These are the partition functions of the transition state and of the reactants. And this is some parameter that most frequently is used to describe quantum mechanical tunneling. And so what we need from this surface uh, are data that tell us about the structure of uh, the transition state. We usually know the structure of the reactants. Uh, but it might give us that information as well. Uh, and this activation energy here, and uh, we would want to know the curvature of this uh, potential energy surface in this direction in order to describe the tunneling process. And so what we do is we use uh, electronic structure calculations. And what we said was there are... <laughs> a variety of ways in which you can do these calculations, some of which are going to be more accurate than others. Uh, as you move towards the more accurate uh, um, techniques, uh, you uh, require more computer time in order to, to do the calculations, uh, but these are getting more, these sorts of um, calculations are getting more and more frequent. And we said that you need to describe the, uh, what's called the basis set which are the orbitals, the atomic orbitals, that you're going to, going to incorporate into the description of the um, uh, orbitals for the molecule, that you're, for the molecular system you're dealing with. These are the orbitals of the reactants and the trucks. These are, these are the orbitals of the, of the whole system, okay. yes. Uh, and so it's a molecular system, if you like, the reactants, transition state, and going over to the products. Um, and you have the atomic orbitals uh, for this system, and the basis set of those atomic orbitals is getting more and more complex as you go down here, more and more complete. And often what people do is to move along in this direction and then do what's called an extrapolation to the complete basis set limit. Going in this direction, uh, we're improving the description of electron correlation, of the, the fact that the, mo the motion of one electron affects the motion of another. Uh, and that's an important effect. And again, you're moving across in an in ever-improving uh, direction as you go along here. Um, the other thing that we talked about was the need to um, describe what are called multi-reference effects, uh, where just one molecular orbital description of the transition state may not be enough. You may need to have two molecular orbital descriptions of that transition state and a mixing of those two in order to describe its properties and its energy effectively. Uh, we also talked about uh, uh, den DFT, density functional theory, uh, which is more empirical. It de depends on uh, tuned fun what are called functionals uh, and the great thing about DFT is that, it, that it's fast. Uh, and so what you, it, much faster than these 
very high level ab initio calculations. Um, and so what you often do is to use density functional theory to um, determine the position of the uh, transition state uh, and uh, its, its frequencies, and then you refine in particular the energy of the transition state using these higher level calculations, having decided where that transition state is. And obviously, uh, one of the things that you need to do in locating that transition state is move around on the surface uh, until you find that maximum in the reaction coordinate. Uh, and so that has to be done by some sort of search mechanism. Uh, we said that uh, new high-level methods can be very, very accurate. And uh, I showed you data for, uh, from uh, work by John Barker uh, using this C4 method. And this is quite some time ago. Uh, uh, but including not only high-level ab initio calculation, but also anharmonicity. Uh, we said that uh, most models use rigid rotor harmonic oscillator models for the, for, the, for the reactants and the transition state, but often that isn't good enough. There are anharmonicities in the, in the vibrations. Uh, the energy levels aren't absolutely evenly spaced, and there are interactions between the different vibrations as well. And so in these very high-level calculations, uh, it is possible to allow for anharmonicity and coupling between these different modes, and also a, a, a more complex description of tunneling. And you can see the quality, that's a comparison between the ab initio calculations and, and the experiment, and it really is very, very good indeed. Uh, and this was another example, a more recent example from Stephen Klippenstein, uh, looking at uh, these are calculations uh, of, a, of a somewhat lower level, but in which the um, uh, energy of the transition state is tuned to get a better fit with experiment. Initially, the ab initio calculations don't give such a good result, but you can tune the energy by a relatively small amount, only just over a kilocalorie per mole, and get a much better agreement. But then this is a high-level calculation without any tuning at all, uh, and then finally a high-level cal calculation with some tuning, a much smaller degree of tuning than was the case previously. So um, I think that what we can say, and I would strongly recommend you if you're interested, to go and read Stephen Klippenstein's article in the last Combustion Symposium, published in 2017, and I gave a reference earlier on. Uh, and he gives a very good description of just uh, what a good place high-level uh, uh, calculations are now. And uh, oh, one other thing that I... Oh, yeah, so this... We then moved on to talk about radical-radical uh, reactions... And we said that this is, is we, we, we're now presented with a new problem. So if you think of methyl radical coming in to react with a methyl radical, then there's no obvious place to locate the transition state. Um, and um, we said that uh, the location of the transition state has to be determined what we call variationally. Uh, and what happens as the molecules move, the radicals move together, is that the spacings of the uh, rotational and some of the lower uh, frequency vibrational motions get, get wider. So, so uh, the spacing gets bigger, and so the densities of states decrease as we come in. Uh, but in addition, the energy is decreasing, so there's more energy available. Uh, the potential energy is decreasing, so there's more energy available to distribute between them. And so what you finish up with is a minimum in this density of states, um, and that's the location of the, of the transition state. And uh, what we showed was that uh, the ability to reproduce the rate constant depends very sensitively on the quality of the potential energy surface that you use to describe the approach of these two radicals. Uh, and uh, this shows just how poor some of the predictions are compared with experiment uh, if you're not using such a a good technique. And some of these are relatively high-level methods. So it's very hard to do these calculations really very well. And those are, are, are the best. These are from the Argonne National Lab. Those are the best predictions, which are quite close to experiment. And what they argued was the theory is better than the experiment. 
But what I'll do later on is show you that uh, experiment can fight back and uh, uh, come, up, come up with, uh, with quite good predictions. Uh, we then talked about situations where there are multiple transition states. So as you, as you come in from the reactants going through to the products, there may be more than one transition state. And we talked about techniques whereby what you can do is uh, uh, determine the rate constant, which at, uh, at high temperatures, it turns out to be determined by the inner transition state. So this is HO2 plus HO2. So here's the inner transition state. And at lower temperatures, is determined by the outer transition state. Um, and that's, that's a quite general sort of behavior. And we showed one or two examples. Um, I talked about OH plus, plus DME and showed uh, how you can get really quite interesting effects as you go to very low temperatures as that outer transition state becomes more and more important. And uh, we will actually come back to this later today. OK, um, we then went on to talk about master equation calculations. Um, and we said that um, if you're dealing with a, a reaction of this sort, say a dissociation of a molecule AB to form fragments A and B, then it's a pressure-dependent reaction. And um, what people, have, people used to do was to use the old uh, um, model um, based on which is called lindemann hinshelwood theory uh, and modify it uh, in order to get fits to experimental data. Um, but a much better approach is to use a master equation methodology. And we said that what, what a master equation consists of is you take the energy of this molecule AB and you divide it into what we call grains. And those grains might have a... Um, a width of, uh, of a fraction of a kilojoule per mole. Um, and what you do is, is you sum up all, so you, you treat that as being a set of energy levels with the same average energy. Uh, and you add up those energy levels in there and associate it with a particular energy. And you do that for all of them. And then what we do is we look at collisional energy transfer between these levels. Uh, and dissociation, and if, a, if appropriate, association. Um, and we express the kinetics in terms of a matrix equation. So we have a, dis, we have a, a differential equation for uh, the population of this state up here, in which we'll have production from higher and lower energy levels, and also dissociation and association, if appropriate. So, so we write down a differential equation for that, and we write down a differential equation for all of these energy grains. And um, we then express that in a matrix. So the C here is a, is, a, is a vector which gives us the concentrations of all of these energy grains. And M is a, a, a matrix, uh, a, a square matrix, which describes... Uh, the energy transfer processes and also the dissociation processes. And then, and all of these processes are of first order. Uh, and so we can solve this using standard matrix methods, getting eigenvalues and eigenvectors out of it, or eigenvectors and eigenvalues and eigenvectors of M. And it turns out that uh, the rate constant that we need corresponds to minus the value of the, uh, the, minus the smallest eigenvalue, smallest magnitude eigenvalue. All of these eigenvalues are uh, negative. The system is, is decaying. And the, the smallest magnitude eigenvalue corresponds to the rate constant. All of the other eigenvalues correspond to collisional energy transfer uh, between the different grains. Uh, and so, uh, and those are all larger in magnitude, uh, or we hope will be larger in magnitude, than the, this smallest eigenvalue down here. And what they do is they describe the, um, uh, the, evolu the, the evolution of the, of the population of the energy grain is due to energy transfer. Uh, and so what is happening there...
is that we're, we're looking at energy transfer in upwards and downward directions. Uh, and what that does is it generates a steady state from which the molecules react. Now, let's see what those steady states look like. Let's just remind you of this. Um, whoops. So if we look at the, the populations, I think we use the symbol rho to show the population density versus energy. Then if the collisions are very, very frequent, if we've got, we've got a very high pressure, then what happens is the molecule, the, these energy transfer processes occur very quickly compared with reaction. And so we establish a Boltzmann distribution. And so that Boltzmann distribution is going to look something like this. And if that, let's say that's the dissociation energy there. Uh, and um, because these processes are occurring so quickly, then reaction occurs on a much, much, on a much, on a slower time scale um, and, um, and can't really compete with the energy transfer process down here. Now, as we lower the pressure, what happens is you begin to develop a competition with these things here. Uh, and what happens in the end is that we establish a steady state distribution, which is depleted at high energies because of reaction. But we do still establish a steady state distribution. And, we, and the reaction is taking place through, through this steady state distribution. And clearly, that reaction, the rate constant for that, is going to be smaller than the rate constant that we had at the high pressure limit. Um, you do get what's called an induction time, uh, which applies as the evolution, as the collisional evolution is occurring. But the bulk of the reaction, by far the bulk of the reaction, occurs in the steady state, and we can apply this uh, time-independent rate constant to it. OK, so what we can do is we can take minus the smallest eigenvalue, and that is equal to the unimolecular rate constant. We also said that we can apply this to more complex reactions. And so this will be a reaction in which we're coming in and forming a couple of uh, intermediates which then go on and react. And in this particular example, I said that E plus F are products, uh, so they don't return. But so we have a source term here, A plus B, and then two intermediates. And uh, this is more complicated than the sim simple dissociation. Um, uh, and what we've got are these three species, and it turns out we have three what are called chemically, chemically significant eigenvalues. Uh, and uh, we can interpret those in terms of a set of what are called phenomenological rate constants. Uh, and we, we, sh we looked at that in the case of um, uh, H plus SO2 and in the case of the um, one pentyl isomerizing to two pentyl and dissociating. And in the latter case, we had uh, w uh, one reversible rate constant, to a reversible system, so we had the, the isomerization rate constants, so two rate constants there, and four dissociation rate constants, so six rate constants altogether. And what we can do is we can analyze these eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors and interpret them and get out the, what are called the phenomenological rate constants, those six phenomenological rate constants. Uh, and it's, it's a... Um, a pretty a reasonably straightforward method uh, to apply. And I, I told you about three uh, um, codes for doing this, uh, and each of them will allow you to determine uh, these phenomenological rate constants. Uh, some of the codes better than others. Um, so, so this is a problem that we can handle reasonably well. Uh, so we uh, once again, we need... Um, uh, electronic structure calculations to allow us to determine the uh, characteristics of the uh, transition states and also of these intermediates as well. Because, for example, this could be, say, 
a radical reacting with O2, forming a, a peroxy radical and a hydroperoxy radical, and uh, we can't, de nobody's determined the characteristics of these uh, fully um, uh, by experiment. So we have to, de have to find them out by, uh, by theory. So we use electronic structure calculations to determine those characteristics, the energy of this, the energy of that, the energy of that, under these two here, and also the characteristics, the vibrational frequencies, and the structures of the molecules. And then we, we can solve that, that equation and determine these chemically significant eigenvalues, and from those, the phenomenological rate constants. And it, will, it will be those phenomenological rate constants that go into a combustion model. So we can then go from the master equation calculation to the combustion model. It isn't the eigenvalues you need to put in, it's the phenomenological rate constants. And then what we said was there can be problems uh, if that separation of the energy relaxation eigenvalues and the chemically significant eigenvalues isn't, isn't good enough. And I showed you this example from, I showed you one or two examples, but this was for, for xylyl radical decomposition, which is a complex system with 20 wells. And here are the, the 20, uh, uh, eigen, 20 eigenvalues here uh, for the, these, these different, different wells. So these are the chemically significant eigenvalues. And you can see that as we go up in temperature, and sorry, and these ones up here are the... Um, uh, energy relaxation eigenvalues in blue. And that's the collision frequency, which is the upper limit for the energy relaxation eigenvalues. And you can see that as we go up in temperature, uh, some of these eigenvalues begin to overlap uh, with the, some of these CSEs, sorry, begin to overlap with the IERES. And so it's difficult then to determine these phenomenological rate constants. I gave you a reference to a paper by Miller and Klippenstein in which they've uh, demonstrated how you can overcome this problem for some systems. So, for example, uh, it might be that you've got, you've, got, you've got a complex surface that looks like this, and uh, one of the fast chemically significant eigenvalues might be equilibration between these two wells here. So they equilibrate very, very rapidly and more rapidly than the, uh, uh, and on a time scale comparable with the energy relaxation processes. And so what they do in this uh, is, is to treat that as a single species. So they've equilibrated or treated as a single species, and then that removes some of the problems with these, uh, with these overlapping eigenvalues up here. It doesn't always work. Uh, uh, you, event, if, if there's, you eventually get down to uh, uh, some parts of the, of, the, of the system where you can't simply apply uh, equilibration. Uh, and so in those cases, uh, you, you run into problems. And we discussed uh, the situation with cor the coranulin oxy radical, and we showed that we couldn't generate accurate phenomenological rate constants. And we'll return to that tomorrow when we talk about soot. Okay, so that's, that's a quick, 25 minutes later, a quick resume of what we talked about yesterday. Uh, and what we were doing at the end was saying that uh, this code Mesmer uh, has been designed to fit experimental data. Uh, and uh, so it's got a, got a facility in which you can compare it with experimental data by minimizing chi-squared, which is the sum of the differences between the sum of the squares of the differences between experiment and, and model, um, weighted in some way. And the model is often linked to electronic structure calculations of the, of the potential energy surface, and allow, you allow some uh, fitting of sensitive parameters uh, within that, uh, that fitting process. And MESMA can cope with different experiments using different bath gases. Um, as we've said, um, for radical-radical reactions or reactions with, without a, an obvious transition state, it, it can be quite hard to, um, 
do, an, up, do a, an electronic structure calculation which gives you a good estimate of, the, say, the association rate constant. And so uh, what the code does is it uses something called inverse Laplace transformation of association rate constants uh, to generate the uh, uh, rate constants, uh, the K of E's, the microcanonical rate constants, for some of the, the processes that you need. And so what we said was, if you look at the high pressure limiting rate constant, then uh, it's uh, expressed in this form, where that's the rate constant, the energy dependent rate constant, the uh, microcanonical rate constant, density of states, e to the minus e over kt, and there's the partition function. And that's uh, what's called a Laplace transform relationship. And so what, what you can do is you can invert that through an inverse Laplace transformation uh, and go from k infinity to k of e, uh, knowing the densities of states and the energies. The trouble with it is that uh, uh, it's, you need a, a wide range of temperatures in order to be able to do this accurately, to cover a wide range of energies. Uh, and um, it's difficult to measure dissociation rate constants over a very wide range of energies because they change so rapidly with temperature. They've got high activation energies. Um, so <coughs> what we do is, instead of using dissociation rate constants, is to use association rate constants which don't vary very much with, uh, with, with temperature, uh, and link them to the dissociation rate constant through the equilibrium constant. Uh, and that's the... So you're parameterizing the, the association rate constant in this way, sort of three parameters, A, N, and E, in the usual sort of way, then doing the inverse Laplace transformation to generate K of E's. So, so if we've got... A reaction that looks like this, and uh, this is what I'm going to show you first of all, CH3 plus CH3. Uh, uh, what we can do is we can take K the association rate constant, or a parameterization of it, which we're going to fit, and from that parameterization, we will get these dissociation these microcanonical dissociation rate constants. So these are, are uh, linked to this, uh, and they're going to determine the way in which the model behaves, the way in which the model shows uh, the the way in which the model returns association rate constants. We have a set of, of uh, fitting parameters, A, N, and E, uh, and also the energy transfer characteristics, and we compare experiment with theory and get the best fit. So that's what we're going to look at now. So here's uh, some data that comes from eons ago for methyl plus methyl. Uh, and the, the experiments all used pulsed photolysis. Uh, and the low pressure ones used uh, mass spectrometry. The high pressure ones used um, absorption spectroscopy. And remember, this is a second order reaction. So we need to know the absolute concentration of the species. So it's quite, quite a hard experiment to do. Uh, and th these curves show a fit that was done at the same time, but not using a master equation methodology. So um, what happened was um, there were new measurements of the absorption cross-section at higher temperatures. Um, and the, uh, the original analysis had used absorption cross-sections that only went up to about 500 K and then extrapolated beyond that. So the higher temperature data in particular was going to be uh, problematic. Uh, and so new data became available and so it was decided to refit the data. And this was achieved using, using a master equation code, this MESMA code, and using a global fit to all of the absorption data. So take all of the absorption data and, and fit it uh, with the new um, absorption cross-sections uh, and, and, and fit the data like that. So the variable parameters in the fit with a high pressure limit expressed. Uh, there's no activation energy, so it's just expressed as AT to the N. Uh, and then the energy transfer parameters uh, for the bath, I don't know what went wrong there, for the bath gases. And um, so this shows 
all of the experimental data. So here's the experimental data plotted up here. Here's the model data, and that shows uh, the fit of one against the other. So, so the model is reproducing uh, the experiment really rather well. Um, and um, an important characteristic is that you need this cross-section here, and that's coming from the new data, the new absorption data. And this is a fit to all of the experimental data that are available. So in the last one, there were 102 data points. In this one, there are, uh, it doesn't say, but about 200 data points altogether. And a wide range of people generating them, going all the way from 296K up to 1924K. So uh, pulse photolysis data at low temperatures, and then uh, shock tube data at high temperatures. And there's the, the fit of the experimental data to the um, uh, calculated data, and you can see that it's really rather good. There are some uh, outliers, but it's, it, it's a pretty good, pretty good agreement. <coughs> and so from that, you can get, uh, oh, it should also add that this is in, some of this is in helium, some of it is in argon, and so uh, the fitting can be done uh, uh, for argon or for helium, for, for different bath gases, parametrizing the energy uh, transfer parameters of the different bath gases. Um, interesting point is that the reaction is second order in radical, and uh, that means that you can't just uh, analyze the master equation directly because, because it's, it's, it's nonlinear. And so you had, uh, a new method had to be developed using what's called local linearization, and, uh, but you can find that in, in, in the paper. Okay, so um, that's pretty good fit, and here's the uh, a comparison between uh, that fit, the red dashed line, and the theory that comes, that I, we sh I showed you earlier on, that comes from the Argonne National Lab. Uh, where they had said that uh, it was definitely better than experiment. Uh, and up here, these are data that come from uh, NGIT. So these are data from Lev Krasnoperov's lab. Uh, you, did you know Sangwan? <laughs> uh, so, and you can see that those agree. These are, these are recent data published at the same time as this fit. Uh, recent data which agree very, very well with, uh, uh, with the fit and with theory. This dashed line up here is, um, there were some characteristics of the absorption that, that weren't, couldn't be determined directly from the available data, so we used two models for the absorption, uh, and uh, one model works much better and is presumably closer to reality than the other. Uh, but I think what this is saying, I mean, <laughs> uh, I started doing reaction kinetics in the 1960s, and, and if two laboratories agreed within a factor of 10 in their rate constants, then we were doing pretty well. And, and that agreement there uh, absolutely staggers me, and maybe you're less impressed with it than, than I am, but uh, I think that's, that's, that's really pretty good. Okay, now, um, this, is, this isn't in um, what I've given you. Um, but it's uh, but I'll I'll uh, I'll make it available when this all this stuff goes up on the web. Uh, but this is hot off the press. Uh, so this is fitting not to rate constants but to uh, experimental decay profiles. So this is an experiment looking at OH plus isoprene C5H8. So that that's isoprene there. Um, and it's a pretty complicated system. Um, because there is the, um, uh, the, there are the reactants and there are two possible adducts and they can go on and react. Uh, and in addition, um, uh, there is the possibility of an abstraction reaction occurring as well. Uh, and so it's fairly complicated. And, and so to analyze, if you wanted to take a single experimental trace, and analyze it to get those rate constants out, and then fit those rate constants against uh, 
the Mustard equation model, then that would be really rather hard. Um, and so uh, you notice that, that some of these curves, so these are the conditions up here, temperatures of 700, 647, 634, 580, different temperatures, different pressures, and notice that the curves are non, they're, they're not exponential, they're actually showing two, uh, they're actually showing three eigenvalues, but you could, it was just, anal, uh, it was just analyzed, well, it was, was analyzed properly, and so there were three eigenvalues in the analysis as well. And so what, what they did was to take a, do 194 experimental traces under different conditions, and then put those into a, a mesmer analysis uh, using potential energy surface calculations to sort out what was going on with, uh, uh, with, with the reaction and then tune certain parameters. Um, there are two possible adapts. So they, you can add either here or here. You can actually add in four possible positions, but these are much more stable. If you add here, you form a radical center there, and then that's an allylic radical, which is quite a stable radical. Similarly, if you add here, you get a radical center there, and that's another allylic radical. So there are these two major uh, radicals, and uh, what they did was to um, uh, accept the difference in stabilization energy of these, right? In, in the difference in, in energy, zero point energies of these these two uh, adducts, uh, but then tune the uh, so they accepted the difference in the energies, but they tuned the depth of, of the well for one of them, and also the transition state energies, and also the characteristics for the abstraction process. Uh, and then, and, and I don't know if you can see them, but there are red lines here, which are the fits to the data. And that was done for 194 different traces. And so that really establishes the system really quite well. The analysis is, is still going on. Uh, and so hopefully it will be improved even further. But it's, it's, a, it's a nice way of, of, uh, of, of using master equation calculations to um, uh, analyze experimental data. Okay, um, any questions, any comments? Everybody's happy. Ish. <laughs> okay, um, let me have a drink. This is gin. Oh, sorry, let's do the conclusions. <laughs> uh, so we've examined uh, theoretical approaches to determining rate constants from quite simple single-step reactions to multi-well, multi-product processes. High-level theory can increasingly play an important predictive role. Theory also allows us to understand and interpret experimental studies. I think that's, that's a key thing. Uh, and this interaction is key to understanding the validity of the more accessible theoretical methods. Uh, so uh, by more accessible methods, what I mean is ones that ordinary mortals can do rather than uh, people, the, 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 the experts in uh, uh, electronic structure calculations. Uh, and theory provides a more flexible approach than experiment to determining rate data over a wide range of conditions. And it's essential we understand both its strengths and its weaknesses. So um, Shock tubes are pretty good at covering a very wide range of, of relatively high temperatures. Pulse photolysis can cover low temperatures but can't go very high. Uh, uh, to bridge the gaps uh, and to bring the two sets of data together, theory is really very, very important. Uh, in addition to its importance often in providing totally predictive rate constants. Right.
Okay, um, this is the homework from two nights ago, uh, and I'm afraid I haven't been given the answer sheets. Uh, so let me go through it now, because it, it will be convenient for me to go through it now, but you can't follow it on a piece of paper, you'll have to follow it on here, but I'll, 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 I'll try and explain what's going on. Okay, so what we said was, uh, here's the system that we're dealing with, R going to I1, going to I2, and um, the possibility of producing OH from each of these species, and also the possibility of going directly from R to I2. Now, uh, just let me give you a, a reality check on what this refers to. So, um, so, uh, sorry. So, what it refers to is um, this radical. CH3OCH2, which you get from dimethyl ether by abstracting a hydrogen, reacting with O2. So this is R, and O2 is in a high concentration, so we don't need to worry about its changing concentration. This is RO2, and what happens is RO2, so here's RO2, CH2, H. O, CH2, O2. Uh, what it can do is it can isomerize to form this species here, which is the radical center there, and that's given the symbol QOOH. And so that's QOOH. And QOH can dissociate, and you form two formaldehydes plus OH. Okay, so, so this is R, this is I1, and this is I2. And um, you can get well-skipping reactions. So you can go all the way from here over to there, or from here over to there, or from here over to there. And you can also go from these radicals to that radical there. Um, so that's the origin of the uh, kinetic scheme. So everything can go to everything, just about, except that formaldehydes plus OH are a sink. And so this is writing down the rate equations. So what I've done is said, let's let the concentration of R, these should be concentrations here. Concentration of R equal a, little x, uh, I1, little y, uh, I2, little z. And so there's the um, equations for it. So x, R can be lost by reaction 1, reaction 5, reaction 7. So 1 going to I1, 5 going to I2, 7 going to OH. And similarly for y, so K2 coming back to R, K3 going on to I2, K8 going to OH, and so on. Uh, and what we could do is we could set up a matrix equation for that system. The trouble is it will be a th the, 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 the matrix would be a three by three. Uh, so we'd have a cubic equation. The determinantal equation would give us a cubic. Uh, and that's not nice to deal with. So what we do is, uh, and we can rationalize this by looking at the rate constants that we get out of a uh, ab initio calculation or a DFT calculation, um, uh, this species here is really quite short-lived. So one, it's formed from RO2, amongst other things, but it will rapidly dissociate, sorry, sorry rapidly isomerize back to, uh, uh, to RO2. So it's, it's very, very short-lived. And so... What we can do is we can apply the steady state to Z, and that means setting this equation here to zero. Okay, so Z is going to be equal to KFX 
plus K3Y divided by K4 plus K6 plus K9. I mean, that's a very common form for a steady state, uh, for a QSSA result. It's the, the rate constant formation divided by the pseudo first order rate constants, the sum of pseudo first order rate constants, or its loss. And then what we can do is we can substitute this in one and two. So substitute for z here, substitute for z there using this equation and get two new differential equations. And so we get something that looks like that. Uh, so substituting for z in terms of x and y here. And so now what we've got is we can set up the matrix equation, get set up the determinantal equation, and now we've got a two by two. So we can get a quadratic solution for this. And so uh, there's those rate equations again, and here's the matrix that you get. And it's quite interesting to look at this matrix and uh, see what it means. Look at the elements of this matrix. And so the loss of uh, x by, is by reaction 1, 5, and 7. But K5 is effectively reduced because you can come back by reaction 6 from uh, uh, I2 to R. OK, so, so K5 is, uh, the effective K5 is 1 minus K6 over K, where K is defined somewhere, uh, but I think I've probably defined it on the previous slide. Yeah, K is K4 plus K6 plus K9, which are the rate constants for the loss of I2. So this rate constant, this rate, rate constant ratio here is the fraction of I1 that reacts very, very quickly because it's in the steady state, re reacts to come back to R. Other bits of it go to I1 or OH, but K6 over K is the fraction that comes back to R. And similarly down here, we've got K3 uh, into 1 minus K4 over K, so there's K4 going back from I2 to I1. And then uh, this is the production of Y, by reaction one, and that's enhanced because we can go from R to I2 and then come back from I2 to I1. So it's enhanced by K5 times the fraction that comes back K4 over K. So, so you can look at this, this thing and rationalize it, and that's always a good thing to do in a situation like that. Look at those, those rate constants, see if they mean something. They must mean something. And so uh, that, that's, a, that's a good way of understanding that, that you've got the thing uh, reasonably well sorted out. OK, so then we've got a 2 by 2. Uh, we can express it as, in this form, uh, A, B, C, and D. So the A's are defined from these terms here. And so there's the full solution, uh, quadratic. And then um, we can... Um, Uh, expand that binomially uh, by saying, well, this, we, we can look at the rate constants, and it turns out that this term is a lot bigger than that term, and so we can finish up with, with approximate expressions, uh, and then we can use these to understand once again what's going on. Um, the great thing about doing analytic solutions like this uh, <laughs> is that, that you can often understand what's going on, even if what you finish up with with in your predictions is not as accurate as if you did a full numerical calculation. But it helps to understand what's going on. Uh, and uh, uh, I personally, uh, I think it's always nice to, if you can, to try and get an analytic solution, even if it's an approximate analytic solution, to try to understand the reaction system. Uh, I have people I work with who disagree with me totally and say, well, well, let's just go on and do the full numerical integration, and that's going to tell you exactly what's going on. But uh, you may agree with that or you may not. Okay, any questions on that? Is that, is that okay? Uh, I, as I say, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get the solution to you, and I'll, I'll also provide the solution uh, on the web when, this, when the stuff goes up on the web. Okay? 
everybody's incredibly happy. I won't give you that yet. OK, we've got seven minutes left, so let's, let's make a start on this. Uh, so um, what we're going to do now is talk about uh, thermodynamics, um, thermodynamic data, really, uh, where you get thermodynamic data from. Um, uh, you've heard from, I mean, you've um, discussed thermodynamics in detail with Heights in the mornings. Uh, and so that's, this has been a much more fundamental approach. Uh, and what, what I'm going to do now is really try and show you uh, where you can get thermodynamic data from um, and what it's based on. Uh, because thermodynamic data is, is really very important as far as combustion is concerned. Uh, and uh, I mean, a lot of you do, do, do modeling of combustion systems. And and you need the thermodynamic data. It's often there uh, for you, but you m might want to check it, and you should check it, and make sure that those thermodynamic data are actually adequate. And there have been fantastic developments, I think, in, uh, in the quality of thermodynamic data over the last few years, and that's really what I want to talk about. So, um, we need thermodynamic data uh, to determine heat release and combustion processes. So we need enthalpies and heat capacities. Uh, to calculate equilibrium constants for a reaction to give uh, the reverse rate constant from the forward rate constant. So this lecture considers classical thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, very, very briefly statistical mechanics, uh, and their relationships for thermodynamic quantities. Sources of thermodynamic data. Uh, measurement of enthalpies for the formation of radicals. Uh, and active thermochemical tables and the representation of thermodynamic data for combustion models. Uh, this last thing uh, many of you will know much more about than, than I do. So these, these are basically uh, the NASA polynomials and, 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 wh and where they come from. So uh, a reminder, um, uh, a constant pressure, then delta H is equal to delta U plus P delta V. Uh, the enthalpy change in a reaction is given by the sum of the enthalpies of the products minus those of the reactants, uh, putting in uh, these stoichiometric coefficients. And this is really a statement of, of Hess's law that states that the standard enthalpy of an overall reaction is the sum of the standard enthalpies of the individual reactions into which the reaction may be divided. Uh, and then a key, th key issue is uh, we want to know the enthalpy change as a function of temperature. Uh, and so we need the heat capacities in order to do this. And these heat capacities are usually temperature dependent. And so we need to have this integral representation of it. And so this, for example, could be the tabulated Enthalpy of, react, en enthalpy of reaction, which comes from the enthalpies of formation at 298K. And then at constant T, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. RT log K is equal to minus delta G, and there should really be a standard sign there. Uh, uh, and the equilibrium constant is defined in that way. And the tabulated thermodynamic quantities include the standard enthalpy of formation, which is defined in this way, the standard enthalpy change when one mole of a substance is formed from its elements in their reference states at a stated temperature, which is usually 298K. And the reference state is the most stable state at that temperature and at a pressure of one bar. So these are for the, uh, um, 
for the elements. So, for example, carbon, the reference state is graphite. Uh, so, for this reaction, this is, a, the, uh, this is defining the enthalpy of formation of methane uh, coming from, uh, so it's for the reaction carbon, graphite in the solid state, obviously, uh, plus hydrogen in the gaseous state, forming methane in the gaseous state. Uh, and it's minus 74.8 kilojoules per mole. And the standard enthalpies of formation of both carbon and hydrogen are set to zero. And then standard entropies, uh, these are usually based on, uh, on the th third law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of any perfectly crystalline material at t equals zero <coughs> is, is zero. And um, at zero Kelvin, all of the molecules are sitting in their lowest energy level. Uh, and so there's only one way of, um, of putting them all in the lowest energy level, and that's why putting them all in the lowest energy level. So, so the uh, W for that state is 1, and so S is equal to K log W is 0. Uh, and perfectly crystalline, because you also don't want to have any configurational entropy. Um, if you take CO, then when you freeze CO down, uh, then the, it's got a very small dipole, and so um, the, the arrangements of the CO as you freeze it down have very, very similar energies. Uh, and so there is a configurational entropy left in CO as you go to zero Kelvin. Uh, so, so that's the sort of thing. So you need to take account of that uh, if you're applying the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, so the standard molar entropy is the entropy of one mole of a substance in its standard state based on the third law. So the entropy increases. So the, ds by dt uh, is equal to, uh, um, sorry, the increasing entropy is, is Cp over T. And so if you plot Cp over T versus temperature, then the entropy is increasing. The entropy is given by this curve here. And uh, what we can also do, uh, as we've discussed at great length, is we can use uh, the partition functions uh, and calculate thermodynamic data. Uh, and we gave expressions for uh, uh, energies, entropies, um, Helmholtz free energies, and uh, we could also get Gibbs energies from them. Uh, so, uh, so these expressions allow thermodynamic data to be calculated from spectroscopic data and from electronic structure calculations. So, so this is often, this can often be a more precise way of doing it than from available theoretical data, especially for radicals. Okay. Okay, that's a good place to, to stop. So let's have a break and uh, come back in, in 15.